It's episode 160 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the shows and dig through the archives at hankgarner.com. While you're there, like I tell you every week, please click on the links on the right-hand sidebar and subscribe to the show. I'd like to thank some sponsors this week for bringing you the show. Thirdscribe.com is there to connect readers and authors in a brand new way that fosters community and helps authors set up a uh, an author platform. You need more than just uh, your books on sale at any given uh, e-retailer. You need someone to help you build an author platform. Thirdscribe is there to help you do that. Also, if you're a reader, you can connect with some of your favorite authors at thirdscribe.com. Tell Rob and the folks that Hank and Author Stories sent you. Also, thank you to Nick Cole for bringing us Fight the Rooster. Uh, Nick is known for his post-apocalyptic work, but this book is a departure from that in a really fun, uh, kind of noir, innovative way. It's part Catch-22, part The Player. Fight the Rooster is a really unique look at Hollywood and the darkness therein. Also, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Uh, This is a series I'm really excited to to not only have as a sponsor, but to be a part of myself. Uh, The latest edition is Tales from the Canyons uh, in Space, and uh, some really fascinating, great, pulpy goodness stories uh, there. Daniel also told me that there's a great Valentine's special edition uh, coming out very soon, so look for that. You can also uh, find their new Patreon uh, so if you like to collect uh, these awesome paperbacks and the wonderful art, uh, please go visit their Patreon. There's a link in the show notes where you can find Tales from the Canyons of the Dam. Please stay tuned right after the show for a short excerpt from Richard Glebe's Jason Crane series book, General of the Dead. Links to all of these great sponsors can be found in the show notes to episode 160. A thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in the adrenaline-pumping new novel, Galactic Satori Chronicles. Written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, this raucous sci-fi adventure introduces Asher, a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancée's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness onto unsuspecting men and women and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and back again. A fight that will either save the planet or doom it. The first installment in an upcoming series, Galactic Satori Chronicles, is an engrossing look at the manipulation of time, mental projection, futuristic technology, and of course, aliens. By Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, pick up Galactic Satori Chronicles now on Amazon. Link in the show notes. Change is inevitable. It's heading for Earth at 12,000 miles per hour, and it will land virtually undetected. For Jack McAllister, a young writer who has finally launched a career for himself, it begins tragically. His estranged father, a former NASA engineer, dies suddenly at his home in Meriwether, Indiana, leaving Jack's Alzheimer-stricken mother a widow. But in the wake of personal heartbreak, he's confronted by an even more astonishing event, the covert landing of an alien machine in the forest just a few miles outside of town. Now Jack must unmask the true purpose of the otherworldly device that has begun a detailed environmental survey of the woods. Aided by the town's young and resilient female deputy sheriff, he soon discovers that the alien scout is only one small part of a much larger operation, 
and the countdown to a terrifying global catastrophe is about to take place. Drawing deeply from his father's scientific influence, Jack uncovers and ultimately finds himself an unwilling component of an alien plan set to terminate life on Earth as we know it. Crichton-esque techno-thriller with enough twists and turns to keep you turning those pages. The rural setting and the believable character set this apart from the majority of alien invasion novels. Sci-Fi 365.net The Scout by Eric Totsi, now available at Amazon.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm very excited to have uh, L.E. Modisette on the show with me. Uh, I, I can't say enough uh, how excited I am to have you on the show, sir. This is uh, – uh, you have a very storied career, and, uh, and I'm excited to have you on. Thank you for doing this. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I start each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? (laughs) Well, actually, I suppose the first memory is when I was in high school, and I was asked to, as part of a French class, translate the poetry of Francois Villon into English. And um, I did, but I wanted to translate it not just word for word so that it happened to be come out as poetry in English. And my French teacher, who was a actually a refugee Russian countess, I'm not making this up, <laughs> uh, was so enchanted with it that I thought, well, maybe I could be a poet. And... I actually started out as a poet. I did not actually write a science fiction story until I was in my late 20s. I wrote poetry for um, small literary magazines, and as I've said many times, I entered the Yale Younger Poet Contest every year until I was too old to be a younger poet and never got more than a form rejection letter. And I was in my late 20s, and um, somebody suggested, you've read science fiction ever since you were young, why don't you write a science fiction story? And that was the start. Wow. Um, That's a a very daunting task uh, to take someone else's poetry in another language and not only translate it, but uh, I guess translate it so that the the reader in the new language gets the same feel, uh, for for lack of a better word. Um, Did... uh, was that a hard thing for you to do? Uh, did you um, did you like the challenge? Like, what was it about not just doing a straight translation, but actually a uh, uh, you know a, a, a full translation in the in the the meaning of it? Uh, kind of how, how what was your process for doing that? I you know I couldn't necessarily tell you. Um, I mean, at that point, I'd had. That was my fifth year of French, and um, I had some background in the language, obviously, at least on the written side of the language. My accent is still terrible, Um, but I don't know. It just felt right, and I I can't explain it more than that, Um, and that ties into one one, one of my pet peeves about writers, frankly, which I'll take a moment to tee off on. In so many books, I see songs or poems that don't rhyme, and yet they're presented somehow as if, oh, well, I've just translated this. Well, damn it. If it's a poem and it's supposed to rhyme, make it rhyme in English. I don't care what the other language is. Oh, yeah, I I I, I'm with you. Um, what are the? But, but I think I think a lot of people would be intimidated uh, by taking someone else's words and modifying them with uh, while still trying to hold on to that that meaning. Um, I, like I, I understand what you're saying, and I totally agree with you. But I I think uh, people are intimidated by that. Oh, well, I think it's indeed a very daunting task, and I'm not sure. I'd try it now, interestingly enough, but I was young and didn't know any better. And 
And we sometimes do things that probably we shouldn't when we're young. But whatever the reason, uh, that's what got me started. As far as what you're talking about in terms of translation, I've seen this happen before. Uh, there's a French writer, Gerard Klein, um, and I don't exactly remember the name of the book. It skips my mind, but it was translated into English by, and translated by a British writer, John Bronner. Bronner. And I read that book in the English and thought, this is a really good job. Well, I later read another of Klein's books that had been translated by somebody who did not have quite as much, shall we say, facility as a writer in English. And the difference was incredible. So, yeah, it can be a very daunting challenge. Now, you uh, did you publish your poetry? Uh, you said that, that that was something that you did quite a lot of uh, I, into your 20s. I never got published in more than... Magazines, I'll be honest. But some of them were published in those small magazines. Now, I, I still write poetry, and I've often used it in my books. I mean, there are two books in the Recluse Saga, for example, which are literally tied together by a book of embedded poetry, which is also part of the plot and actually is a thread that runs through the entire Recluse Saga. And all that poetry is original. Wow, that that was going to be my uh, my next question: is how do you feel like your uh, your love of poetry and your practice with poetry uh, informs your fiction writing? Uh, other than using it as a plot device, like you said in those books. Well, it it certainly affected my my writing career even because when I started out, <clears throat> and I spent twenty years with David Hartwell in twenty or thirty five years with David Hartwell. And um, David, of course, was one of the few editors that actually had a substantial, shall we say, scholastic background. He actually had a PhD in comparative medieval liter literature. And um, when I first started writing science fiction, almost inevitably, David would send me notes which said, you'll need to expand this. You're still writing like a poet. It's too condensed and cryptic. So yeah, there is a trans there is a transition there because in poetry every word has to count. Sometimes it has to count two or three ways. If you take a look at Dylan Thomas's uh, Villanelle, "Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night," actually the three lines of the first stanza actually have to be repeated in three different places, meaning three different meanings each time. That's the sort of thing that if you study poetry, you get into, and words take on a little bit different meaning or a different usage. Um, I guess that's the best answer I can give to that. Yeah, well, well I, uh, I, th this is kind of uh, very fresh on my mind uh, because uh, a couple of friends of mine were having a debate uh, the other day about the difference in literary writers and genre writers. And uh, one of them said that literary writers are like poets in that they write prose that's meant to be mulled over, contemplated, and, you know, looked at from different angles to, to try to derive what the writer is actually saying. And, um, and that genre writers are more like lyricist, uh, in that their prose is meant to be read in the moment in a, and taken in a stream as the, uh, as the plot moves forward. It's kind of like when you're listening to a song and the lyrics come by. There's no time to, to process it all. You're, you're listening to it in real time as it goes and it's moving, uh, the, the story forward. I, I like, uh, Genre fiction that is very much informed by that uh, kind of poetic or literary tradition where uh, you can read it over and over again and, and get something new and different out of it. Uh, and I've, I've picked up on that in your work as well. Well, in essence, I'm a, a literarily trained writer who loves and writes science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> um, I like that. Well, no, I mean, even in college, um, I spent a couple of years working with William J. Smith, who at that time, well, he was at Williams where I went to school, but he was 
went on to become the poet laureate. Well, he became the poet of the Library of Congress, and that position later became the poet laureate of the United States. But I worked a couple of years with him. And uh, as I said, I didn't get into fiction until much, much later, so I'm sure it informs what I do. Um, You can't... I don't think you can disavow your past as a writer. Sometimes you can apologize for it, but you can't disavow it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Um, you said that you, you loved science fiction uh, from an early age. Uh, what were some of those first experiences you had uh, with science fiction literature that, uh, that intrigued you? And, uh, and what are some of those that stand out to you? Well, the very first book, science- true science fiction that I read. And I can still remember this because somebody stole it. But <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> but it was a paperback version of A. E. Van Vogt Slam. And I adored that book. Unfortunately I read it later when I got much older and I realized that there's quite a few flaws in it. But at the time it absolutely captivated me. And wow. I mean, I never went, shall we say, the the juvenile route, and there's a very simple reason for this. Um, When I grew up, we lived in an area which has since been engulfed by the Denver Metropolitan Megaplex, but at that point, there were literally fields with pheasants behind our house. And the nearest even comic book rack was a mile and a half away. The Englewood Library... I was about three miles away, and my parents didn't like me riding three miles on my bike, so I didn't get to the library very often. But my mother happened to read science fiction, and there was this whole shelf, of not shelf, this small gray bookcase at one end of her bedroom that had all of these science fiction books in it, and I started reading them. And that's simply how I got into it. And that's sort of interesting because usually at that time, women weren't the readers of science fiction. But my dad was an attorney, and he was very, very literal. And uh, he never really did quite understand science fiction. Um, It's proud of me, but he didn't quite understand it. My mother was the one who really introduced me to it. Wow. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, for some people, it really is uh, a hard thing for them to wrap their minds around uh, why we tell these stories or why we enjoy these stories uh, that are so fanciful and kind of far fetched. Um, but there's, uh, you know, science fiction has been greatly uh you know, instrumental in our uh, in our current society that we're living in. I think uh, so. Did did you? Uh, uh, what was it about those stories that intrigued you? Um, I'm probably not typical. I can't say that there was any particular thing that intrigued me in that sense. I think the thing that for me it's the what if implications of it. I never thought of them necessarily as escapism. I thought of them much more as, well, if this happened, then that could be true. And pretty much that sort of mindset's informed everything that I've ever written. Um, For me, there's got to be a core of reality in anything that I write. But that core of reality is rooted in call it the core of human behavior. Um, I basically write about what I believe to be our real people in situations that we don't think of as real, but could be. I like that. I like that. Um, You said that you started writing fiction in your your mid-20s. Late uh, late 20s. Late 20s, excuse me, late 20s. What was that first thing uh, that you you decided to write? (laughs) That's an interesting story, and some people have probably heard it, but I'll make it really quick. I just decided I would write a science fiction story, and I wrote it. And I sent it off, not knowing much better, because I wasn't in the science fiction fan community. I was just a reader. And I sent it off to Ben Bova, who had just taken over as the editor of Analog. And he rejected it. He sent it back with a note that said, this is a pretty good story, but you made a terrible mess out of page 13. 
it's good enough that if you can fix it, I'd like to see it again. So I did. And he bought it. And I thought I was, yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Um, at best count, as I recall, I think I wrote 26, wrote and submitted something like 26 stories before I sold the second one. The third one took about 15 different attempts. And I basically whittled that down over the next five or six years. I was obviously working full-time at other things. Um, until I was getting about one to three stories, one out of three stories published, usually in analog, once to Galaxy and once to Asimov's. And then Ben sent me another rejection letter. And it basically said, literally, don't send me any more stories. I won't buy them. And after I got over the shock of those first two sentences, I read the next paragraph, which basically said, you are a novelist trying to cram stories into novels. Until you write a novel, I won't look at another story. Wow. Best advice I ever got. Because I have sold every novel I've ever written. Which is far better than I did with sub, with uh, short stories. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a uh, what year was that, by the way? Or, or uh, nineteen seventy two? About okay, nineteen seventy two. So uh, the the market is very different uh, these days. It, it seems to me. Obviously, I wasn't writing in nineteen seventy two. I was born in nineteen seventy one. So um, I can't speak to this, uh, but. Uh, from from people I've interviewed and lots of people I've talked to, uh, it seemed like a lot of writers got their start uh, writing short fiction and submitting to uh, journals or magazines or anthologies and that sort of thing, uh, and then maybe graduating uh, or that's not a uh, that's not a, a good word transitioning uh, to to writing novels, uh, and I think very few writers uh, begin now with that sort of mindset. Uh, everybody wants to write that that novel and sell it. Uh, what was the, how was the market different uh, then uh, as you see it than it is now? Okay. Well, I can give you a couple of differences. Uh, first of, okay. first of which is in that seventies period, there were probably no more than 250 to 300 books published uh, in science, science fiction. And at that point there was very little fantasy. Um, Lord of the Rings hit in the, I think it was 1964, but I could, probably a couple of years off. But that was the only really big fantasy hit, and there were not many fantasy stories at that point. The market was largely science fiction. And there were 200 to 300, 250 to 300 original titles, most of them in paperback, most of them less than 90,000 words. At the same time, there was a much broader magazine community and um, the difference in pay between story, what you made on stories and novels was not nearly as great as it is now. Back in those days, I think I sold my first story for a couple hundred dollars. You might only get a thousand dollars for a novel. Well, today, today, the rates for stories haven't gone up that much. And the rates for novels have gone up a whole lot. Plus, according to Locus, last year, well, 2015, there were something like 1,800 uh, science fiction and fantasy novels published just in the United States. Well, that's six, that's six times the market, and that doesn't count self-published. That's from known publishers. So that's a very big change in the market as well. Then you get into... The, the ramifications, and we're seeing in a lot of ways in the last 10 or 12 years a downsizing of the market in terms of income because, and although people tell me it's not so, from what I've seen, it is so, um, ebook pirating is basically cutting down on, shall we say, the low end ebook market and certainly the mass market paperback market has taken a huge hit. And every publisher will tell you that. Uh, if you were a high mid list, low best selling author in the late mid to late 90s, you could count on a press run of 50 to 100,000 
on your first paperback release, re-release of a hardcover novel. Today, you're lucky if you get twenty-five to 30000 unless you're George R.R. R. Martin or somebody like that. <laughs> right. But if you're George R.R. R. Martin, that advance has to stretch over six or seven years between books. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to speak to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> We love you, Mr. Martin. Please come on the show. Um, so, uh, so that first novel that you wrote, uh, was it science fiction or fantasy? Science fiction. Okay. What was uh, – kind of where did the idea come from uh, for that? Your your – you're shifting gears because of this editor uh, has kind of chastised you a little bit that you're uh, that you're writing the wrong form. Uh, so kind of how did you set out to to tackle that and uh, where did the idea come from? I can't tell you exactly where the idea came from. I can tell you exactly what the idea was. Basically, I married Norse mythology, Norse mythology and time travel. But it was fine. Nice. Now, that that's an interesting combination. Uh, you, people would think immediately, "Oh, that's a that's a, a fantasy. A, that's a setup for an epic fantasy." There, but time travel and then uh, with science fiction element. Did did you uh, did those things seem at odds to you uh, when you were writing it? No, I have a little bit different different mindset. I think. Um, my wife says, you think weird. Um, but <laughs> basically, My wife says the same thing. <laughs> um, basically, as far as writing goes, I firmly believe that whatever you're writing, the, quote, universe you're writing in has to have rules. And the second point is human nature doesn't change. Doesn't matter people are going to still operate in pretty much the same way. There's always going to be a profit motive. There's always going to be a hunger for position and power. People are going to want love. They're going to want to be adored. And they're not going to do very much that they don't get paid for in one way or another. Those are the basic underlying things of human nature. It doesn't matter if the world's run by magic or technology. They're still going to use magic as if it were technology. Because that's the way we are. We make anything into a tool. So I don't see, getting back to the gist of your question, I never did see a huge difference between, call it fa fantasy and science fiction. I stayed with science fiction because that's what I started with, raised with it. And I didn't even think about writing a fantasy novel until much later. Those uh, those aspects of the human condition uh, that you were talking about, uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with Dan Wells uh, one time, and he's he writes mostly science fiction and, and horror. Uh, but we we were talking about that that we all want to tell these stories about the human condition and the the plight of of humans. We're looking for stories we can connect with, and the the genre stuff is just window dressing uh, that goes on that. And I always like that uh, description. And it sounds like you're uh, kind of approaching things from the same way. Yes and no. I don't think it's window dressing. Um, I think it is as real as any universe we're in if you do it right. Um, one of the great advantages of either science fiction and fantasy <clears throat> in exploring the human condition is that it removes the reader enough from the present to allow them to contemplate things that they could not possibly entertain otherwise but should. I'll tell you a story along those lines. Okay. <laughs> right after my first big fantasy, which was The Magic of Recluse Hit, I wrote a Washington science fiction novel called The Green Progression. It was a, the only novel I've ever written as a collaboration. I wrote it with a consultant that I'd worked with in Washington, D.C. And I'd actually spent about that time close to 18 years in Washington, D.C., first as a legislative director for a congressman, staff director for a successor, head of uh, congressional affairs at EPA during the Reagan administration, and then as a consultant. And uh, I wrote this novel, and Tor published it, 
and it got some pretty good reviews, one of which said it was one of the best descriptions of contemporary politics written in a generation. It was the worst-selling hardcover that Tor published in the 90s. Wow. And it took me a long time to understand why. Because that description from the review was absolutely accurate. And nobody really wanted to know how politics really works. But if you take those, that kind of politics, and I've done it, and you put it in a science fiction or a fantasy setting, people will entertain that. And they'll think, well, that's sort of like what we're seeing here, isn't it, today? But they can look at it because it doesn't jar against their preconceptions. And everybody holds their personal ideology incredibly tightly. And if you challenge it, they'll reject it. If you put the same questions in fantasy and science fiction, they're much more likely to consider it rationally. So if, in a way, what I do is put rational questions in what some would say is an irrational framework. <laughs> I like that. That's that's a great weight uh, for the storyteller to to carry. Uh, if you really think about it, you know we're we are bringing. Uh, but some people these... do. And some people don't. I mean, <laughs> Heinlein had a very interesting take. On, well, I should say I have an interesting take on something that Heinlein had a take on. If we're going to be honest about it, years ago, <laughs> years ago, he gave a speech at the um, U.S. Naval Academy. It's called Channel Markers. And in it, he basically pointed out that there were really at basic, basically only three plots in fiction. One was what he called Boy Meets Girl, the love story. One was Seven at One Blow, off the old tale, which is the little shot becomes a big shot. You reverse that, big shot becomes a little shot. You got Lear, a classical tragedy. And the third plot mm. was The Man Who Learned Something. Well, Highland wouldn't have considered it, but there is actually a fourth, fourth plot, especially in genre work today. It's what I call the mindless adventure story, or you could call it the video game come to life. Um, or, as I've also called it, the James Bond plot. Um, I call it the James Bond plot because if you take James Bond, okay, the big shot, it becomes a little shot or vice versa. Never happens in Bond. He's always Commander James Bond at the beginning and end of every movie or book. The love story, any woman he's with at the beginning of a movie, with the exception of one book, is dead at the end. And the one that's with him at the end of... The one that's at the end of, end of that book isn't there at the beginning of the first book. So there's no love story. And then, the man who learns something, Bond makes the same mistakes in every movie and every book over and over and over again. Mindless adventure story, but people love it. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Um, how do you you have you have written several long running series? Uh, the the saga of recluses. Um, you've uh, let's see the the forever hero series, the uh, uh, the Korean chronicles, the imager portfolio. Um, when you set out to write these, do you plan for these to be uh, long running series, or uh, do, do the characters just demand more attention when that book is finished? Uh, kind of, what's your approach to those? <laughs> The Magic of Recluse was actually written as a standalone. And it became a series because David Hartwell liked that world so much. The reason it could become a series, however, is the way I, I think, because the way I approach writing. I don't start with the characters, I don't even start with the story. I start with the world. And basically, I have to get a picture of what this world is like. 
what its technology is, what its culture is, what its institutions are. So I have a real picture, and also what its history is. And even in my one-off science fiction books, every single one of them I could write a series out of because I've laid enough background into it that it wouldn't turn out as unworkable. I've often seen a lot of science fiction books, particularly science fiction books, where I'd say, I could say, yeah, that society makes sense. But the second question is, as somebody who's studied a lot of history and technology, I can't ever figure out how you could evolve that society. There's no way to get to that society, given both human nature and what have you. I don't like writing stuff that you can't get to. So I always have to figure out, how did they get there? And that's always in the back of my mind. So, and the other thing is, I don't write once I have written more than three books about a given character. <laughs> and that was in the uh, Imager portfolio. I was writing about Quaret. I thought I was going to write a two or three book series about him. Well, I got about halfway through the second book, and I called up David Hartwell and said, I can't do this in three books. It'll be four. And he laughed. Well, it got to be a little bit bigger than that, and it ended up five books. And when I told him that, he just laughed harder. Because he knew how I hated to write that much about one character. But the story was just too big. The Reckless series, at this point, consists of 18 published books, plus the short story, plus another novel that will be out next October, um, which is done. But there are no more than two books about any one character. The stories take place in that world across almost 2,000 years. And they involve five separate continents, some 20 different countries, myriad of cultures, different belief systems. I'm really writing stories in a fictional world rather than a series. That's a long answer to your question, so the, but it's the best I can. No, no, that's that's no, that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, so the uh, to you, the the world is what really engages you, uh, and, and and becomes the tapestry to then weave in these these characters and these plots and and things like that. Um, how how much preparation would you say uh, you put in when you're uh, kind of dreaming up this new world and, and there's gonna be a book that comes out of this, what, how much preparation goes into that before the actual writing begins? That's really hard to quantify. I mean, I can tell you some of the things that I do. I mean, if I'm doing a fantasy, I will have a map. And the map is there to make sure I don't screw up. It's as close to scale as I can make it. And it looks like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> it's done in pencil, and I don't have all the map things, but I do make sure it's to scale and that the geography makes sense and all the rivers run downhill and the mountain ranges are wide enough because they're more, wider than most people think they are in real life, that sort of thing. Um, then I go for the institutions, the kind of cultures, making sure that they fit the geography, the topography, etc. Make sure that the cities that are major cities are either on big rivers or on on oceans, etc. Um, belief structures, and of course, whether it's a technology, well, usually these are fantasies, and what the magic system is and what the social and political and economic implications of that magic system are. But part of that is, I, I was going to say, part of that is also subconscious. Uh, you have to, I have to at least trust my subconscious. I don't advocate this for most writers, but I'm not most writers, and I don't mean that in, in, in an egotistical sense. I had a tremendous advantage as a writer in the sense that I didn't start to write anything, even short fiction, until I was almost 30. 
At that time, I'd already had a couple of years in Washington, D.C. I'd been a Navy pilot. I've studied history. I've got a classical education, frankly. Um, I had a lot of experience, and I'm a voracious reader. I didn't plunge into this. I mean, and, and I had written professionally. Every job I had professionally had to do with some form of writing. I'm not sure you can trust your subconscious until you've got some of that experience behind you, which is why I wouldn't advocate it for most young writers. Right. And I, I think too many people approach uh, research or uh, kind of the the informing uh, process that they go through before uh, writing. I, I think too many people uh, approach that kind of on the fly. And as I need to know something, I'll look it up and try to learn about it uh, instead of just immersing themselves uh in those things that that then later will will come up as you need them. I, I, um, think, I think maybe I'd put it a little differently. I, okay. I think people concentrate too much, if you will, on the gadgets as opposed to what lies behind the gadgets. Uh, I don't need to know, frankly, the dimensions of a particular kind of sword. I do need to know how it's forged, because that, in essence, determines the economic structure, the political structure, and what have you. I don't need to know exactly how a mill works, but I need to know how it fits into the society economically. The details I can look up later, provided I understand the framework in which it fits. And I don't think a lot of writers have a strong enough back, background in economics and history, frankly. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, the the line between uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, sometimes can be a little hazy. Uh, the, the two genres, even though on the surface seem to be uh, very disparate, uh, a lot of times are not so much so. Uh, how do you uh, how do you tackle when when something's going to be science fiction or fantasy? Um, uh, how do you start kind of parsing out where this story needs to go and the uh, the things that make it what it is? I, I guess I fall back on simply a very old, simple definition. If it's theoretically possible by the science we know, it's going to be science fiction. If I have to change the rules of the universe... It's going to be fantasy. <laughs> I mean, which one of those two uh, is easier for you? There's no difference. Um, I mean that very seriously because if you're working off the rules of the universe, you just set, you either say, "Okay, I'm using classical physics or as close to it as I can get it with what I know," or I'm changing the rules of the universe, and these are the rules I'm going to play by. In either case, you've got a framework on, under which you're operating. Gotcha. Um, one thing I'm very fascinated with is uh, is, is people's uh, writing process and, and kind of how uh, writers go about doing the work of writing. Uh, you started writing and publishing in the, in the 1970s. Um, can I assume that you were writing on a typewriter at the time? An electric typewriter. <laughs> right, an electric typewriter. Well, I, the um, reason for that is pretty simple. I have lousy penmanship. I get writer's cramp after about 150 words writing longhand. I started writing on a manual typewriter when I was 13 years old. One, because the teachers could read it. And two, because it was a heck of a lot easier for me. And so I basically stayed with the electric typewriters until we got to the uh, 286 computer processors because of the way I wrote. The earlier computers just didn't work out very well with me. 
But as soon as they had a processor that had enough memory, and I'll get to the reason why in a half second, I dropped, jumped to computers and I've been with them ever since. The reason I needed a little more processing capability was, especially when I started, I tend to write mosaic fashion. And I'd have this big accordion folder, and basically I'd type out this part of the story and that part of the story, and I'd stick them in the slots in the accordion file and fit it all together. I mean, a story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But you don't have to write it in that order. And sometimes you don't even have to publish it in that order. But the pieces have all got to be there. But nobody cares how you get to it as long as it's a finished piece when it's done. Um, I can, I can, I'm trying to picture in my mind you, you collecting these, uh, these sheets of paper with different pieces of the story and then, uh, and, and then piecing them together later. Uh, we are definitely spoiled, uh, with word processors and, you know, just being able to, to copy and, and paste and move around, uh, I, as we want. I, I swore a lot during those days and I used, <laughs> as I, and I used a lot of whiteout. <laughs> Well, you know, that um, I, I know a lot of writers that, you know, you may get, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent into a novel and then realize, oh, you know, if this happens, I need to go back and change, you know, several, uh, you know, several important pieces of the story to, to get to there. Uh, and if you're, you know, typing on paper, that can really cause problems. Uh, d- did you uh, did you ever get a, a situation like that and, and have to completely rewrite? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and, uh, and and you were thankful that the two eighty six computer came along. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very. Oh, uh, that's yeah. What, what is your uh, what is your your writing technology uh, like today? What uh, what do you use to do your writing in? Right now, I use Word. It's accepted. I'm not totally happy with it. There are a lot of times I swear a whole bunch at it because, (laughs) well, I mean, from a practical point of view, I've got to use a system that my editors and my publisher is compatible with that. So that means nothing exotic. For a long time, I used WordPerfect. Unfortunately, WordPerfect fell out of favor. I liked it because it was a keyboard system more than a mouse system. And for somebody who types halfway decently, it's a faster system. Um, But got to the point where WordPerfect, I couldn't literally get printer drivers for it. So I switched to an earlier version of Word, which I liked because it converted my old files from WordPerfect into Word without too much trouble. Well, that vanished, so I've just stayed with a semi-current version of Word. Um, The current version I'm not real happy with because it has this very nasty habit uh, of having certain key combinations that will literally destroy what you're writing if you type too fast. Yeah, I, I and and it's it's a shame that word processors have gotten away from uh, like like you were talking about with Word Perfect, uh, the the more uh, keyboard driven uh, because ultimately you want to keep your hands on the keys and keep typing, and some some things that they've tried to make easier for us are uh, are, are thorns in the, in our side for for sure. Yeah, well, I mean. I don't even know the current stroke, but it has a. If you hit a Control H in the middle of about four different keys, it will close the document you're in without saving it and shuttle you to a new blank page. (laughs) Oh, thanks, Microsoft. Which is why I save very frequently. Right. Which again takes a little bit more time. Because you've got to use the mouse to do it, or a, or a specific keystroke series. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, tell us about your. You've got two books uh, out 
uh, very recently, one in January and one that came out just a couple of months ago or three, three or four months ago in October, uh, Recluse Tales and Treachery's Tool. Tell us about those and, and kind of how those fit into the, uh, the, the tapestry of what you've been doing before. Well, Treachery's Tools is the 10th Imager Portfolio book. And the Imager Portfolio is, of course, another one of my series, which spans about, at current rates, about 800 years, shows the evolution of a technological culture which also has magic. And uh, Treachery's Tools takes place at the midpoint between the first three books and the next five books, which I wrote the, should we say, the present books. Those are the latest ones first. There are three books of that. Then I wrote five books about the founding or the events that lead to the founding of that society sent 700 years earlier. And uh, Madness and Solidar and Treachery's Tools are midpoint books about, should we say, a transition from a period equivalent to the, shall we say, Renaissance slash Industrial Revolution, although with magic, in the middle. And Treachery's Tools is the second one about in that period in which magic is caught between a rising middle class, a landed aristocracy, and an overpowering king. <laughs> and... Uh, As with everything I write, it's a bit intricate. <laughs> and Reckless, Reckless Tales, which just came out a couple weeks ago, that's a very different book because it's actually a collection of short stories, and the stories take place across the entire history of the world of Reckless, of the saga of Reckless. Some tie loose ends, some are freestanding, uh, some answer questions that readers have had. But the interesting thing about this collection is there are 21 pieces in it. The first one is an essay which basically describes how I came up with the magic system for the reckless world. Um, and then of the 20 stories, only three of them are reprints. The other 17 I spent almost 10 years writing as original pieces because I never liked the idea of basically charging hardcover prices to my readers for something that they could have read someplace else. So 17 out of the stories, including one novella, are literally original. They've never been in print before. But because I, because I write short stories so slowly compared to novels, it took... Yes. Uh, Mr. Modisett, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Uh, where can people uh, follow you online and, and connect with you? And uh, if they've not read you before, uh, maybe discover your your huge back catalog and uh, and kind of uh, get into what you do. Um, I do have a website, and it's lemodisettejr. dot com, and it's just all run together. L e m o d e s i t t j r dot com, and it's got all of my books on it. I do a twice weekly blog about politics, writing, what have you, and uh, there's a place where people can ask questions, and uh, I update what I'm writing and what I'm reading on it. It's probably a stand all thing. I don't do Facebook, um, but. There's my email address is on there, buried. So you have to look for it because I discovered it was too obvious. I got trolled too much, <laughs> but right. But it's there. Gotcha. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm a big fan, and uh, I'm going to send over as many people uh, as I can to to check out your site and to uh, get them turned on to your work. Uh, thank you so much for coming on oh, the show. Thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Stay tuned now for an excerpt from General of the Dead, Book 3 of the Jason Crane series by Richard Gleaves. A link to the series is in the show notes. How do we know when we are watched? 
Do the eyes of a predator reflect moonlight, focusing it on our skin? Do we feel two little spots of white on our neck and bristle with fear? I knew I was watched, and I could feel its quality. A man's gaze, like yearning eyes in a smoky tavern. I felt drawn to it. I skirted the pond, and beneath a vine-choked bower I found the horseman's severed head. The braid at the back had snagged on some twig, turning the dead eyes upward. A dragonfly rode his cheek. It fled as I reached for him. I took hold of his braid, like the vine of a pumpkin, and drew him from the water. We sat together on a mossy log, he and I. Oh, I felt such joy to look upon his face again. I wiped the mud from his lips and nostrils, preparing him to be buried. The Domine could not watch the graveyard always, I decided. I would wait for night to fall, steal a shovel, and do the work myself. A trio of colonial soldiers were raising a redoubt nearby. Thomas the gravedigger brought them his own long-handled shovels. He stood and watched the soldiers work with professional interest, as dirt was his trade. Autumn leaves snagged in his hair, but he was too busy tale-telling to notice. The morning's dark business had quite bewitched his imagination. But the big one was a Hessian! One of them horsemen? Head lopped off by a cannonball. He'll be a-haunting this place now, he will, with a hip-hip and a clippity-clop. I'll be seeing headless spooks in my burying ground. Just you wait. And if he can't find his own head, he'll be wanting one of ours. Lord love us. He shivered, hands in pockets. The soldiers laughed at him, but the boy was serious. Our legend had begun to spin itself already, from the lips of our tow-headed gravedigger. Fact and fiction going their separate ways, severed as they often are. I listened with fascination. I had always loved a ghost story, and I'd never witnessed the birth of one before. Ghost stories are a form of history... If we say, three men died building that church and they forever haunt it, we keep those souls alive in death. Ghost stories are the past bleeding into the present, demanding acknowledgement of those unseen presences all around us, in our street names and genealogies and on our crumbling headstones. The tragedy of Old Willow, the fall of the horseman, the fate of you or I, these tales are forgotten by academic historians, who chronicle only great men. But our small lives are remembered, so long as our ghost stories are told. That is why we must tell them and retell them, and keep them kindled in the hearts of our children. Pick up the Jason Crane series by Richard Gleaves at Amazon.com. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Join me each Tuesday and Friday at hankgarner.com for a new episode. Thanks for listening.